idea was going going beyond the uh, going beyond the written score, looking at the connection of visuals to music and how we design interactions for music. Um, and I come at this from a musician, but we had people coming from a lot of other perspectives. I say that only because someone showed up who had her student actually has clinical synesthesia, which is a whole other category where it's really an involuntary experience of another sense. Uh, so it's sort of on another level than what we were talking about. We were kind of talking about design. We had graphic designers, we had film directors, we right. had musicians, so it was a pretty eclectic group, right? Absolutely. And none of them could sing at all. <laughs> right. That's unfair. That's, That's unfair. not true. In fact, uh, we had a singer. So, uh, Peter, over to you. Great. Uh, so I decided, since we're at the end of the day, and people have talked to you about what I saw, one slide that was billions of dollars in revenue doing something, and we've talked about APIs, and we talked about application development, that I would actually do something musical. So I'm going to just play with uh, something I built using one of the tools that we used. This isn't a proper performance, but I'm going to just make some sounds for a moment, and then we'll talk so that there's a, a musical moment uh, first. And if I could have a little more volume, that's... using um, allows me and other people to develop um, music and visual interfaces at the same time. And um, this was kind of what we were talking about yesterday. Now I have to switch from music mode to presentation mode. But, uh, my name is Peter. It says my name is Friday. Uh, but my name is Peter Kern and I'm, I'm from Kentucky originally, I've been living in New York and recently moved to Berlin. And if you put an at symbol in front of my name, you'll find me on Twitter. And what I titled the talk yesterday was uh, going beyond the score. The idea of being able to draw musical interfaces. 
So I don't know about you, but for me, I'm not an artist, I'm not a designer, really, even. Um, but drawing has always been an intuitive way of expressing myself. It was also an intuitive way of distracting myself during math classes that now I wish I'd paid more attention to since I'm writing software. Um, but drawing is such a natural activity. So when we look to solve problems, like how do we design the future of music apps, as you may have been thinking through the course of this afternoon, or how do we find new ways of making music with all these tools, uh, drawing and, and, and the kind of intuitive visuals are a good way to begin. Um, we can let the computer draw as well. So we can draw interfaces that become musical interfaces. And, um, you can't really see that, but imagine a, a line drawing there that the computer can also draw as it listens to sound. Uh, and I run this website called Create Digital Music. Um, so I, on that website as a, as a writer, as well as a, as a composer, we deal with a lot of these issues. In fact, people who came to the workshop who read my site said, well, that was interesting. I'd seen a lot of it before. Um, so people who read my site do have kind of a constant view inside my brain. But I guess what interests me the most, and what I find interests a lot of other people that I talk to, is how can we see, how can we grasp the stuff that's invisible? Sound and music are not things that we can see, they're invisible. How do we kind of grasp what's going on? And I think two filters that we especially want to be able to grasp that stuff are design and, and process. So a lot of what I write about on the website and a lot of the conversations I find that I have with musicians and developers and engineers is what the process of making their tools are, what the process of making their music is and the, the process of designing around these things. So whether they're building an iPad app or whether they're building a new piece of music or a VJ performance, they're all kind of thinking about how they can design around these things that they want to express that are otherwise invisible. And we can, we can model some of that interaction. So, you know, when you see people with iPad apps or iPhone apps like we saw earlier today, um, they are making some kind of motion, some kind of movement. So there's this motor input, and then there's this sonic output. And I suppose that's true. I don't think about listening as much as creation, but I suppose it's even true when we look at tools like Spotify and SoundCloud and, and, and those tools as well. What lies in between is this, this visual metaphor, the thing that makes the invisible part of this interaction visible. So there's a, there's a visual interface that you see when you, when, you, when you use software, when you look at a music, musical score, when you pick up a musical instrument. And that visual interface determines how you behave when you, when you touch the thing. And then it also can respond as you play. It can respond and, and it can change in the case of an instrument or an interface. So what we talked about yesterday was how to think about some of that visual metaphor. Um, I'm trained as a classical composer, trained as, we won't comment on how good I am at it, but I come from a long training as a classical composer. And we have this system of graphics that represent lots and lots of information about music. And if you really pull it apart, as if you've never seen it before, in this group of people we had a lot of musicians, so we had all seen it before. But if you pull it apart, there's, there's all this information embedded in that score. The, the grid of the pitches, this meta information, and the clef and the key. There's temporal information, division of bars, and all this stuff is graphical. It's all designed in a way to be really quick to recognize. If you're bad at sight reading, it may not seem so quick, but if you watch people who are good at sight reading, you realize the system is, can be amazing. People can recognize this stuff really quickly. What's happened over the last century or so is we've been, it's such a good system that we look for ways to get beyond it to express the things that it can't express. Um, so we look for ways of exploding pitch going beyond that grid of, of, of specific notes that kind of matches up with what you see in a, a piano keyboard to being able to look at all kinds of other gestures and all kinds of other sounds and being able to explode its, its model of time, too. 
So we're at this amazing moment now with software, which is that what avant-garde composers were starting to do in the last century, we can now distribute as millions of copies of an iPhone app in, in this century. So the going to all these kind of strange graphics was something that a handful of avant-garde composers were doing when they needed a way of describing electronic sounds. So this is a score for a tape, tape music piece, and it, it needed these kind of weird graphics because there was nothing in notation that could describe the sometimes frightening sounds that you could make with tape and electronics. Those experiments led to technological experiments, it's the composer Zanakis, decades before the iPad, decades before there was even a graphic tablet that was available to consumers, was looking for ways with his UPIC system of being able to draw sounds and then immediately realize them, the thing that we can all do now. So we have this thing, this, this, these gadgets, the iPhones and iPads or Androids, um, and, and they, they have this interface that is quite a lot like finger painting. Um, the, the, the question kind of becomes, well, you know, what can you do with that sort of finger painting metaphor? So what we spent time doing yesterday and what I'm kind of doing more with my time is figuring out how to go to the, from these natural doodles and sketches and, and drawing to being able to design new graphics. Um, we yesterday looked at some examples of that just this week on a lot of the tech blogs with something called Sketch Synth. An artist is doing this interface where you can draw lines and buttons and things and, and those can become a musical interface. And we see a lot of drawings too. If you, anybody who's an app developer probably spent some time sketching things on paper. So you go from these paper sketches to, to these applications um, and you really start with a, with a pen and paper. Um, what we worked on yesterday was three tools. The first two are, you just heard in the, the piece that I was improvising with. Um, one is called PD and one is called processing. They're both free software tools. But we also got to spend some time yesterday doing uh, paper prototyping and, and working with a pen and paper. I like that all these three began with the letter P. It seemed much cleverer earlier today than it does now, but, but. so two software tools and one paper tool. Um, the two software tools, uh, if you want to go check them out for yourself, one's called Pure Data, and it's free and open source uh, synthesis software. You've heard it already today, not from me, but in RJDJ. It's the engine of RJDJ. So the RJDJ app that you heard uses this. You will hear it again because Matt Black, had, uh, when he shows off his app, is, is also using PD as the engine of, of that tool. And it uses these boxes that you connect graphically. So it's a, it's a graphical programming environment or data flow environment. You take these little boxes and you connect them up with virtual patch cords in the way that you would connect up modules of a synthesizer. Processing, which we abbreviate P5, is a code tool. So you use words and text and type them in instead of connecting these visual boxes. Um, they both actually have a very similar lineage though, despite, despite having those kind of different interface metaphors. And so it's a, it's a kind of a good exercise to get to use, to get used to get to use both of them, and they're both completely free, and they have lots of users and lots of documentation. They're also a good place to begin if you've never been a programmer. So there are, I'm sure, talented programmers who are gonna be hanging around this weekend. But if you wanna be able to kind of deal with them and do something yourself, when they're not around, these are a good place to, to start. Uh, we also spent some time drawing sketches, so we, we had people doing doodles and then we tried to convert those doodles into sound. It's a lot of fun for me to look back over these sketches and the things that people did. And, and uh, it's also interesting to me because people's sketches were all quite different. Uh, you would expect to see kind of only the same things, but people sketched very different things. So it's worth getting people, your friends, to pick up a pen and paper and see what they do. We had one group that did something kind of fascinating which was they went through all their ringtones and sketched like graphical metaphors for them. And so you can see all these doodles have 
or visual representations of the sounds, and then they kind of came up with narratives and, for the sounds and word associations for them. And these all came from the different uh, iPhone ringtones. Um, somehow there's a, a Texas, a Texas, uh, oh, I can't remember what this is. Oh, guitar on the beach. We're playing a guitar on the beach in Texas. Uh, we're in an Ed Wood movie listening to a UFO. So they came up with some kind of crazy ideas. These are their sketches. And um, yeah, all of these came from the iPhone. We also have some people who are continuing at the Hack Day to play with live visual interfaces. So hopefully, if you stick around later tonight, here's, here's one of those examples. Um, we'll, we'll see more of this. So if you want to kind of join this adventure, um, these are the places to go. Uh, PD is completely free, and like I said, there's an embeddable version called LibPD, and I could do a demo of it now, but I think those other two apps would be an even better demo. So when you see Matt Black uh, show off this new Ninja Tune Remix app tomorrow, it is, it is powered by this engine. And that means that the knowledge of how to do cool stuff with sounds how to remix music is received in, in these things that you patch together. Rather than reinventing the wheel and, and building everything up from scratch, you build on everybody else's knowledge. Processing does the same thing with code. The, the Ninja Tune tool, again, you will see it's C++ relative. So if you've heard of MaxMSP, PD is the open source cousin of MaxMSP. Processing, which is written in Java and runs on Mac and Windows and Linux and Android, because Android runs Java, has a, a cousin that's written in C++. So you get the performance benefits of C++ and you run on Mac and Windows and Linux and Android and iOS, since iOS doesn't have Java. They're on the iPhone and the iPad. And that means that with open frameworks, using code that looks a lot like the code that I used for the thing that I just did, uh, the Ninja Tune app is able to run on the iPad and the iPhone. So these are all, all free tools. So you don't reinvent the wheel, it means you create software that can run in lots and lots of places. And you create something that is future-proof. So the pen and paper stuff isn't going away, which is good, and it's future-proof unless it gets dropped in a river or set on fire or whatever can happen to paper. But the software is now future-proof as well. So in 20 years, I know I'm going to be able to use a pen and paper. In 20 years, I'm probably also going to be able to use some version of processing and open frameworks. Definitely going to be able to use some version of PD. PD is already um, almost 20 years old. And it's based on software that's almost 30 years old. And it uses metaphors that are now uh, 60 years old. So this stuff is, is lasting. So with that in mind, if you want to have something to do for the next 60 years, um, you can go to those sites, libpd.cc, and we show off what this can do so you don't only see technical stuff, you see what it can do, and the same at processing.org. And you can find me on Twitter at Peter Kern. My next project will hopefully be taking this stuff and making it more accessible to people who haven't done it before. So walking through a set of tutorials that teach you how to use PD and processing more or less at the same time to do basic sound stuff. If you want to bug me about that or ask me questions, or say I didn't understand anything that you meant, uh, you can find me on Twitter. And then again, it's uh, createdigitalmusic.com. Anything that goes there, I read someday. Peter, so, thank you thanks very, so much. very much. Thanks for that. It's a great